I'm Gordon Raquel from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at filmmakeru.com or check us out at Twitter on filmmaker underscore you. Every week we we interview a film professional to discuss their work, and this is made possible by our sponsor, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. This week, I'm joined by VFX supervisor and artist Marcus Teromina, uh, whose work includes The Fast and the Furious, Bird Box, and most recently, Army of the Dead, among many, many other great projects. Welcome to the show, Marcus. Thanks for having me, Gordon. Now, one of the things I've noticed with uh, VFX supervisors is I feel like your job is (laughs) someone's going to be like, we have this crazy idea, and then you have to innovate and problem solve (laughs) and figure out how to actually do it. So how do you approach a project when, you know, it could be the craziest request, whether it's a zombie tiger or, you know, driving cars in a weird thing on Fast and the Furious? Well, first of all, thank you for acknowledging that because (laughs) it it goes unseen a lot. And it's, um, it's a tricky, it's a tricky spot to be in, but one that I enjoy, um, Part of it is is the problem solving of it. So kind of break it down. Um, when when I approach a project like Army of the Dead, for instance, and we just talk about what you, you mentioned, the zombie tiger, um, the first thing I do is talk to the director about it and talk and understand what's your vision for this? What are the sequences we need it to be in? Is there a look established or do you want me to establish that look? And then you kind of just, you, you break it apart, if you will. You like do a big ex- a, an explosion of it and say, okay, I need this part done on set. I'm going to need the interactive with the tiger. I'm going to need a performer there because there's interaction with our cast members. So I need that yanking. Okay, so then I'll have to talk to stunts, right? And I'll have to talk to wardrobe because that'll be interacting with wardrobe and then we'll have to attract the blood. And then I'll also have to talk to makeup effects because we want to have some in camera. And I think that's important too, to mention because in visual effects, we don't want to just do it all digital, right? We want to have a base to build upon. So in, in the sense of a zombie tiger, sure, you're not going to go find a real zombie tiger, but for us on army of the dead, we said, okay, we, we need to find a base that we're going to, build from right so we went and filmed an actual white tiger and filmed a lot of the movements of uh the piece the 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 script beats that we knew of um the mauling the attacking the jumping and then we used that as our base in addition to intertwining with all the other departments scene to scene beat to beat to figure out what else was needed for that that point so that's like the the tip of it and then we go into okay now we've shot that right so that there's the there's the production there's a pre-production aspect of it the production aspect okay we've shot that that's what we're committed to and then the the post-production aspect of it so when we get into editorial there's hundreds of selects to choose from right so our editorial team can select something zach puts it together i look at it and i have to envision what that green performer is going to be, what that's going to be doing. And then as, as that, as I'm watching that cut, I'm going, okay, that's, that might be an issue. You know, they, they chose this select, here's an issue in that select. And we need to figure out, oh, you know what, like that interaction isn't quite right. So we may need to do a a digital part to it. So again, it's like the problem solving. And then we, in post, we exploded again. And, and, you know, in my mind and just like ding, 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 ding. And like kind of check all the boxes and make Mm -hmm. sure um, to, to then go and execute, right? So then the, the next step of that is talking to the facilities that I've enlisted to do the work, which there could be, you know, there could be upwards of a dozen of them uh, and, and just talking to them and giving that direction as I hear it from Zach, but also uh, in this case, Zach, but from the directors, um, as I hear it, but then I need to be technical on it and how to execute that vision. So I hope that answered the question. I kind of went into it real deep there, but. Well, it makes me think like, how do you, because they're going to come to you with the script and be like, here's the script. And you're like reading it and they're like, zombie tiger. Okay, well, I'm going to circle that. But how do you give them a sense of a budget when, as you were mentioning, you'd be like, oh, that didn't work. We're going to have to fix that in VFX. And you don't know exactly where, where the costs could come in at the last minute. 
So <clears throat> in pre-production, it's a lot of planning, interdepartmental planning, right? So mm-hmm. when we drill down and we say, okay, this is what the shot is going to be. And then I'll go ask art department, are you going to build an entire set or are you going to build a partial set? Okay. You're going to build a partial set. That means I need to do this. And then if I've worked with the director before, it makes it a little bit easier because then I can kind of visualize it in my mind. Okay. Okay. They're going to shoot this way this many times this way this many times so budgeting it is is one of the many difficult parts of this process and that's where i have a a visual effects producer with me as well so Mm -hmm. we'll go through the script highlight it beat to beat things that i know those won't those may not work in camera or they're going to need support by us or just you know the history of uh in my profession, like what, what does, what doesn't work where I can see like, Oh yeah, you'll try that in camera, but we'll need to enhance it later on. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, we do that line by line. And then we kind of assign like a a shooting methodology, if you will. And then I go to each department and say, Hey, you're going to build, you know, special effects. You're going to build this big rig for us. Right. Okay, great. That's going to be great because our cast can get on it, but then I have to remove that rig and replace it with a digital creature. And then I go to it like, so it's, it's that interdepartmental. And then you just, again, I go line by line and then we assign numbers to that and kind of come up with a, 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 a big budget. And what usually happens is you bring that budget and I have discussions with our director to say, I'm feeling I know where this is going. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Look, I'd love to do all this, but we're over budget. So we go, mm-hmm. where can we, and, and that's also my job. It's like, I'll come and I'll already have a targeted list of where I know that we could cut costs. Or if I say, if you just turn the camera this much in this scene, we can save a bunch of money there. So that's, that's where on set um, I use that methodology that we've created and it's not a perfect world and never goes the way that we plan. So Mm -hmm. You know, there's been instances where we we think we're not going to have any visual effects and suddenly we have to, you know, prop up a car and the car needs to be propped up by this massive rig. So I have to put a blue screen behind it and uh, in front of it. And then we have people crossing behind. It. I'm like, you can't do that because I have where are the people there's digital people that are practical and we don't have that budget. So I, we have to reblock the scene. But those are all cost and cost centers that I in, in post, we kind of have to shuffle that money around and figure out mm-hmm. like where we want to spend it because ultimately it's it's the studio's money but it's the director's money right so it in in a sense it's like where do you want to spend your money right so a lot of people nowadays are like we just do the paint outs over there and and that's great but you're speaking you're spending the director's money and the director might not want to spend that money on the paint outs he might want to spend it on a creature shot or an environment Mm -hmm. so it's so it's so interesting (laughs) it's is there you know, because like I said, there's innovation and trying to come up. Is there like a shot or a moment that you've done in your career that you're like, uh, that you're really proud of how you innovated or changed the way it worked or figured out a solution? Like, is there a solution that you're really proud of? There are a couple. um, And I, and I, I feel like the answer to the question, I have one in particular and I have have many, but I have one in particular, but I think the answer to the question in a way is, it in all, I feel like in all those situations that I'm super proud of it, it was also the most difficult challenge. It was all the most difficult puzzle to solve. Mm-hmm. And there were constant fa- like failures or like re- reboots of it along the way. Like, I'm going to do it this way. Oh, no, that's not going to work. Okay, we'll do it this way. I think that's going to work. Right. And then you kind of, I have to go through it in my brain and the technicalities of it and, and then talk to our facilities and make that, you know, that make them comfortable because we're about to commit this money to you, but also I just don't want to hand over things that are problematic. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's that dialogue back and forth. But what I would say, honestly, is we just, um, we just replaced uh, an actor with an actress in an army of the dead. And that mm-hmm. is by far one of the most challenging yet the, the proudest I am of, of my work to date. And, and there, it was such a technical challenge from so many levels. So that was, that was TIG. I don't know. If yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask about that. Cause that's such a crazy change to go. Like, how did you guys tackle that? Like, how did you approach that, that situation? Yeah. So uh, one, one fact in there is that we were, <laughs> 
we were near completion of the film. We had about 20 visual effects shots, which is not a lot of shots left. Mm -hmm. And Zach called me and he, he told me about this. The, and he's like, let's, we're going to have to recast. And I was like, okay, who is it? And then he told me, and then I go, okay, who are we casting? And then it's like, okay, it's Tig. All right. Well, immediately like look at what the size <laughs> difference is. I'm like, okay, we're up against this. Um, and then, you know, like, like I was explaining earlier, you just kind of break it down into chunks and I go, okay, we, I, I know we have multiple lighting scenarios, interior, exterior, it's daylit, uh, it's, sorry, it's daylight. Um, we're in moody lighting and interiors. Okay. So there's going to be a lot, you know, I have to separate the scenes and then it's, mm -hmm. and then there were, 2D and 3D is what I separated the scene. So I knew with a with a 3D camera move or like a, a complicated camera move, if you will, in, in layman's terms, like there would be no way that we could replicate that. And just to, to mention, we said no motion control just because of the setup and the time. So that means that replication of that camera move, uh, if we had used motion control, it would have been an easy thing to do. I mean, easier thing to do rather. Um, so we decided we weren't going to do that. So then I had to pull into 3D, which I knew I'd have to do a digital TIG, which is a whole separate process, mm -hmm. the digital version of TIG, and then the 2D. And when we got into the 2D, I went through the entire cut with our with our editor and Zach uh, and, and our director Zach, um, and we looked at each scene. And because the movie was so good at the time that we were about to finish, we decided we can't change this. Like we the movie's good. Let's just make it better. So it would have been easy to lift scenes and recut and say like, Oh yeah, we'll just, we won't worry about that scene anymore, but we didn't, we didn't want to. So in doing that, I asked, you know, I had to find multiple takes, right? So if there's one take, if there's one frame of a background behind me, like if we look here and then I move that just the one frame would be enough for us to paint that back because we had to remove Chris then we had to paint back everything that was behind there to create what's called our clean plates, right? Which then another complication is that there were 10 cast members. So behind me, there's three other people. When I go like this, there's nothing there. So I have to paint back their, you know, lower body or something like that. So once that was complete, then we had to film the footage and the footage um, again with the lighting scenarios. And then what we realized along the way is that all of these, these beats in the movie kind of had a centralized anchor point. <clears throat> so we ended up calling those back from our, our uh, original photography. So, um, you know, Bly's casino, there's a, the foam core model. So we use that to line our cameras up against, and then we would walk our cameras back to be a little bit wider because we were handheld. What in our original photography, what we saw didn't you know if it tilted like this that meant i had to have that much more tig in there so we kind of walk it back um and then we shot our elements and then we ended up on the day mixing them between so we had multiple monitors there and we'd mix our original photography overlay tig into it and i would watch those takes with precision to say like okay you need to do just this micro adjustment right here and i'd put a tape mark down and i'd tell Zach like, Hey, she's close, but it's not quite there. You got a scooter there. Cause she floats in that one set she's going to float in it. And we don't want to do that. Like the whole idea is to not do as many digital takes as possible. Um, and then I'll just wrap it up. I mean, I could talk about this forever, but one of the, the main um, challenges in this is, was the lens optics. So in our original photography, Zach shot it at a extremely uh, shallow depth of field. It was a 0.95 which meant everything was blurry. So in 3D space where TIG was, we couldn't shoot our elements with that depth of field because she would just be blurred or shoot, there would be focus issues left and right. So I had to convince him, we have to shoot these on sharp lenses, which in his mind were like ugly lenses. So I said, okay, that's, that's fine. You just have to trust me on this. I need a wider depth of field. I can, I can match our lens optics. And I had to like show him all the, uh, I was like, look, I can, I can show you here's, here's how it matches. And he's like, I don't know. I was like, I have to do it this way. We have to do it this way. So in compositing, we had to match all of those lens optics back, which, which took a very long time. Um, and then after that, it was that kind of the explosion. So the next puzzle piece was 
okay, now she's in the scene. Now she's composited in the scene. What's missing? The little dust poofs, her shadow on the ground, interaction between cast, you know, those little micro details that make the shot that much better and believable in the end. Now, I have a selfish question here. I've been watching Tig's work for years. She has the driest sense of humor and is just so funny in her delivery. What was it like working on set with her? Tig was great. Um, kind of exactly what you're saying is Tig. Um, <laughs> the thing that was tricky is that we did this during like a big surge uh, right before the big surge of COVID. And we were one of, I don't know if we were one of the first, but we were, we were certainly a handful of firsts that were shooting in COVID. So we had these face, we had the face masks and the masks, and we didn't really know about COVID that much yet. So we knew, okay, so it was a limited crew. And then we brought Tig on and she's just surrounded by green screen and there's no one for her to interact with because remember we, the other 10 cast members. So it was kind of, it was funny because the dry sense of humor, you know, we, <laughs> I'd ask her like, you gotta do another take. And it'd be like, oh, okay but no one's there anyway. So I'm like, yeah, but, <laughs> but they are there. You just have to imagine that. And, or I'd say like, you're floating into that cast member's space. Cause if she was floating, that means she's like going right through them. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and, and it's just kind of like that, that dry delivery even then was like, oh, okay. And then Zach kind of, he kind of nudged me one day and he's like, you got to tell her she's doing a good job. And I'm like, no, I know. <laughs> and then, so every once in a while I burst out and be like, great job, dig awesome work. That was a great take because in my mind as the visual effects supervisor, I was looking at it at the technical aspect, right. Of like how, her actions and what they would relate to in our original photography from Zach's, obviously he's directing her and he's like, you got to give her props on her action. And I'm like, Oh yeah, sorry. Sorry. So but it was fun. She was great. She was a great sport. Um, and in the end, Zach gave her like the, the, the award for most out of focus character in the movie, just because <laughs> of like, you know, she was like, I never get to see these people. I don't even know if she's ever even met the cast. Not I don't think it. she has. Yeah. Cause I know in an interview, she talked about not meeting them. Yeah. So, but she was fantastic sport. Great to work with. I asked her to do a bunch of weird things and she was kind of like, okay, this is what you need, you know, walk cycles and such like that. But she was a great sport and ultimately helped us create what we did. So. Now you've continued to work with Zach on his next project. Um, so one of the things I'm always interested in knowing, is, you know, like I see that with editors where they're used repeatedly with the uh, a director or a particular cinematographer as a how do you build that relationship with the director so that they can trust you and they can they can believe in your your work um so that you become that go-to person for them yeah that's great you, you hit it right there though it's the trust right you got to build the trust so um my job is to to support the director just like any other uh, head of department but but for me i don't want to go in and say no right? I can't do that. Or no, we can't do that. I have to figure out a solution to the problem. And I think that's one thing that I, I believe that Zach kind of, we built that trust because there was never a no from me. It's a no, let's, we'll figure that out, you know, or we'll, we'll, again, like it does come down to money and time in the end. So it's like, we'll figure out how to, how to support that. And if there were times I would, I would raise my hand, like for, you know, for the TIG stuff, again, going back to the TIG stuff, for instance, it was like, you, you got to trust me here. Like, and, and, you know, Zach has done so many projects. And like, for me to say for the first time out of the gate, I was like, you got, you, you cannot, we cannot shoot this this way. And I, I, I know that I can match it. I know that we can match it. We have a great team. We can do it. And, and that was, that was a leap of faith on, on both our parts. Right. Because um, he had to trust me and I had to trust him <laughs> and I have to also deliver it to him. So again, it's kind of like building that along the way. And then there's just a dialogue that it, you, you work so many hours with each other and there's just this like dialogue um, and just like the, the visuals and understanding each other. And, you know, what was great about Zach is I came on with him and it felt like I'd known him for years. So we just kind of have that, that good dialogue, which is, mm -hmm. which is important. Well, how do you, cause he's such a visual 
filmmaker, right? Like you can look at his films and know that's a Zack Snyder film. So how do you get into or onto his same wavelength in terms of the look of a film? You know, it's, um, it's interesting because Zach is, he, he, he'll storyboard his own movies and his storyboards are amazingly accurate to what we shoot. So um, getting into the visual style of it, and especially on this one, like kind of, it was, it was, it was a lot of pressure, right? You're coming on and you're like, we have, to, I have to deliver for Zach. So um, understanding it, starting to design early on, um, bringing, uh, like, I'll give you an instance, like Zach's, like you said, Zach has a, a, a strong visual style. Like even the level of detail in our muzzle flashes for the movie, we did a whole R and D phase. So I guess as soon as Zach would say, Hey, I want to do this, I'd figure out a solution to start that up in the con conceptual and design phase to give him a bunch of looks and, and kind of base it on history, but also base it on you know, what looks good, what looks cool, what's in the, in the spirit of uh, the movie that we're doing in this case was army of the dead. Right. Mm -hmm. So I study those lens optics and we figured out like a solution to give like, you know, CG shell casings and also lens flares with a muzzle flash. Like it could have just been very easy. It could have just been make a muzzle flash. I say very easy. Every shot is complicated <laughs> one way or another. But just put a muzzle flash on there, right? Okay, great, easy. But it's like we had to design a muzzle flash look over multiple things for the entirety of the movie. Um, so it's just starting those early, understanding, having a lot of conversations with him, a lot of um, reference to um, putting a, a, a big lookbook together. You like this, you don't like this, and it kind of honing in, in a bit. So, mm -hmm. is there, so they've done you did army of the dead and then recently they did army of thieves. Uh, are you hoping that uh, Zach will go back for a, an army of dead follow-up and uh, see where this world goes? I'm very hopeful. We had a lot of discussions and ideas about what that could be. So I'm hopeful that, um, that uh, it, it, it comes, uh, it comes to fruition. Yeah. Now I have one last question that I ask everyone I've, I've been interviewing. We've been stuck in the pandemic and depending on where you are in the world, sometimes you're, you know, locked down or sometimes you're able to move around. Um, but a, people have turned to streaming services. Is there a show or a movie that you've discovered in the last year that people should check out? You know, I have a funny one here. Um, and, and, and it does relate. Uh, I, I don't, I, here, I'll, I'll tell you. It was Tiger King. And yeah. the story behind Tiger King is, is that I was co totally unaware of it. Um, and I was actually, we were working remotely at the time. I was working on Army of the Dead. And I heard this voice uh, from the other room. And I walked.